Probably not. <laughs> <coughs> OK, uh, so let's begin. I'm going to tell you about uh, sum of squares lower bound for the planet clique problem. Um, so I started thinking about this problem last summer. And this uh, particular talk is based on joint works with uh, Boz Barak from Harvard, Sam Hopkins, and uh, Anne Potechen from Cornell, and John Kellner and Ankur Moitra from MIT. So there's a bunch of people here. <laughs> OK, so, um, so the problem of our interest today is the planted clique problem. So it's an average case version of the clique problem. And what you're given here is a graph uh, constructed in the following way. You first draw a random graph from the elder Schrony distribution, which is every edge chosen with probability half independent of others. And then you choose a uniformly random set of omega vertices and add the clique on them. So the job of the algorithm is to look at this modified graph and tell me which uh, vertices uh, did you add the clique on. Okay? So uh, now with high probability in the random graph, the largest clique is of size about 2 log n. So as long as I add a clique of, say, 3 log n in size, the added clique is uniquely identifiable. <coughs> the question is, can an efficient algorithm recover it? Now one uh, simple thing to observe is that if omega grows larger, if I add larger and larger cliques, then it becomes easier and easier for the algorithm to find it. In particular, if you add a clique of, let's say, square root of n log n size times some constant, then just looking at the largest degree vertices will tell you what the clique vertices are. So the question, therefore, is what is the smallest omega for which a polynomial time algorithm can find the added clique of size omega? So the world record for the smallest omega is uh, due to an algorithm pro by Alon, Krivilovich, and Sudakov from 1998. And it is based on looking at the spectrum of the adjacency matrix of the graph. And it works so long as omega is some constant times square root n. Huh? Any, yeah, any constant, in fact, yes. And. Uh, the state of the affairs is that if, if you make uh, the omega, say, polynomially smaller than root n, so if, if, let's say, it's n to the half minus smaller of 1, then we don't know any polynomial time algorithm that will work. Okay? And we also know, in fact, we know some lower bounds that tell us that root n might be the right number for polynomial time algorithms. And these lower bounds basically work in some restricted models. So uh, why do we care about this problem? So I want to claim that it's one of the central problems in average case complexity today. In particular, this assumption that polytime algorithms cannot find added cliques when they are of size smaller than root n has been used to prove a number of very interesting results. So you can, with a variant of this assumption, get a public clique capture system. You can get hardness of uh, sparse principal component analysis in machine learning. You can prove hardness of computing approximate Nash equilibria in game theory. And there are a bunch of other applications that I won't go into. So that's one reason why you should care about um, you know, if there is a fast algorithm to solve it, because if there is isn't, then we get a number of nice results. Um, so I told you about the problem of our interest. Let me tell you about the algorithm that we like today. And here is my drawing of the algorithm. Uh, this is the sum of squares semi-reflect programming hierarchy. It was invented by a number of different researchers in a uh, very different context, in fact. Uh, for this uh, two, three minute introduction to this algorithm, you can think of it as just a strengthening of the basic semi-reflect program or the spectral algorithm that we saw earlier. So basically, you are adding more and more constraints to this, uh, uh, let's say, the spectral algorithm or the basic SDP. So it's, it's basically not one algorithm, but a sequence of algorithm, depending on how many constraints you add. And you index into this sequence with a parameter d known as the degree of the uh, algorithm. So the dth algorithm in this hierarchy runs in time about n to the O of d. Um, so as, as d increases, the running time increases, but so does the power because you're adding more and more constraints. In particular, constant degree algorithms correspond to polynomial time algorithms. Okay? So why do we care about this algorithm in particular? Well, it has been very successful uh, in designing algorithms. In particular, it captures the best algorithms, best approximation algorithms for sparse cut and unique games. Uh, it is known to break in polynomial time the hard instances which were constructed for weaker algorithms for problems such as max cut, unique games, and balance separator. And we also know that at least for some large class of problems that includes constraint satisfaction, it is an optimal algorithm amongst all algorithms based on semi-definite programming. So there is some principle where you can define this statement in a rigorous way. In our context specifically, we care about the sum of squares program because it has been successful in the recent years for solving other average case problems. In particular, it gives us a fast algorithm for solving the planted sparse vector question, which at the face of it looks similar to planted clique. It also solves a dictionary link question, which is, again, an average case problem studied in machine learning. So with this sort of algorithmic success, even if you are uh, a guy fond of algorithms, you would, you, would, you would probably want to investigate whether this algorithm gives you some leverage, some power um, in this planet leak question. 
So that brings us to the main question uh, that we are going to investigate today, which is what happens when you run the sum of squares algorithm on the planet lake problem? Okay. So this question uh, was uh, first proposed by Raghu and Avi. And in fact, they conjectured that a uh, polynomial time sum of squares algorithm cannot find cliques when they are smaller than root n in size. So basically, one way of saying is that uh, basically poly time SOS is no better than the AKS algorithm I showed you before. Okay. And uh, we know poly time really means constant degree here. And I'm going to ignore enter the small of one factors throughout this talk. So uh, in the past couple of years, there has been quite a bit of progress in trying to uh, attack this conjecture, uh, starting with the work of uh, Raghu, Avi, and Aran Potechin, and independent work of Deshpande and Martinari. The state of art, the state of art today is that we know that the conjecture is true for degree four. Okay, and this was uh, what we did in joint work with Sam Hopkins and Aran Potechin, and this result was also independently discovered by Raghavendra and Shram. So the, this talk is going to be uh, about. Uh, a very recent result where we can basically now show that the conjecture that MW made is true. Okay? So we'll show that for all constant degrees, and this goes beyond constant degrees, but for the purpose of this today's talk, uh, I'll only claim that for all constant degrees, root n in fact is a threshold where polytime SOS begins to fail. <coughs> so uh, it's, um, it's, it, it's, it's not uh, that clear, but I think you can show that root log n round SOS will not be able to find cliques much smaller than um, a root n either. <coughs> right, or lower Shriver. Yes. Uh, you mean uh, worse in the sense that you will be able to yeah, find? Uh, oh, what we can prove? Um, uh, yeah, let, let's. Yeah, I, I don't want to claim any specific because I, the what happens beyond constant round is somewhat unclear, and you'll also see where it sort of comes up. But at this point, I want to claim that uh, what we can definitely show is that polytime algorithms cannot find cliques smaller than root n. The exact dependence, in fact, uh, is uh, it might even be you, this algorithm should do better than lower Shriver, but how much better is unclear. Uh, yes, the was Schreiber. <laughs> yeah, I, I escaped uh, pronouncing the name in the previous slide, but I got caught here. <laughs> okay, so um, one of the key ideas in proving this uh, new result is a new view of the algorithm itself as uh, what we call as the Bayesian view, and I'm going to explain what this means. And much of the focus of this talk would be in understanding what this means. And I'm, I'm hopefully going to convince you that uh, this is an interesting way of looking at the algorithm and proving new results about it. All right, so uh, this is the plan for the rest of the talk. So I'm going to begin by telling you something about the sum of squares algorithm. I'm going to tell you about two objects which are sort of duals of each other, sum of squares proofs and pseudo distributions. Then I'm going to tell you the first strategy that MW came up to prove the conjecture that we wrote down in the previous slides. I'm going to show you why this strategy should feel fishy to us. It doesn't really should, it, it shouldn't and it doesn't give us uh, the conjecture. But while analyzing what goes wrong with it, we'll be able to come up with principles that tell us what the right strategy should be. And that is going to be this Bayesian pseudo distribution, uh, which will indeed give us the right lower bound. Okay, so so most of, most of the talk is basically going to be how to come up with this Bayesian pseudo distribution and why you think it works. I'll only have time uh, about, um, I'll probably only spend two, three minutes in describing the PSDNS analysis, which is the main technical part of the proof. Okay? <clears throat> so uh, let's start with the first part. So throughout this mini introduction to the sum of squares method, I will use the planet leak problem itself as a running example. Most of what I say is actually general, but we'll stick to this example for today's purposes. So in the clique problem in general, you're trying to understand whether there is an omega size clique in this graph G that you're looking at, right? So the sum of squares method is a general method which works on polynomial optimization problems, which means that the objective and the constraints are polynomial, uh, the constraints are polynomial equalities and inequalities, and the objective is a polynomial, okay, and all real polynomials. So the first thing we want to do to understand this problem is to convert it into a polynomial optimization question, and that can be done in a straightforward way here. Um, 
Uh, let me just walk you through these constraints. They're very simple. So you think of x as a vector uh, indicating a zero-one vector indicating the variable, the vertices of the clique. One xi being one means that ith vertex is chosen. So to force that x is an indicator, you add the constraint that xi squares equals xi for every i. You want to find a set of size omega, so you add the constraint that some xi is omega. And since you want that x indicates a clique, you add the constraint that whenever i and j don't have an edge between them, you can't force both xi and xj to take the value 1, which means mean that xi, dot, xi times xj is 0. Okay? So it's quite straightforward to check that these equations are feasible if and only if there is an omega size clique in the graph G. OK, so um, given this system of equations, what would an algorithm do? We are interested about the sum of squares algorithm. But let's first start with an algorithm which is all powerful. What would an all powerful algorithm do? So um, an all powerful algorithm will, if there is a solution to the system of equations, he'll come up with some distribution which is uh, uh, supported on omega size clicks in the graph. So omega size clicks are just the solutions to the system of equations, right? So we'll think of this mu as uh, capturing the knowledge of a unbounded uh, uh, algorithm about uh, omega clicks in the graph G that we are looking at. Okay. Now, since mu is a distribution on omega clicks, we can expect it to satisfy some nice properties. So let's see what the kind of properties we are interested in. So uh, let's say E uh, is the associated expectation operator. Then mu is supposed to be supported on all points that satisfies the three kind of constraints I wrote down, we can infer the following equalities. Now, if you take any function q, which is any polynomial here because you're looking at 0, 1 to the n as a domain, and if you multiply it by any polynomial, uh, any constraint which is forced to be 0, then the resulting polynomial is pointwise 0 on every point in the support of mu, which must mean that it, gus it, it should get a 0 expectation. So you can write these three kinds of uh, zero expectation equalities just from the constraints we started with. And this has to be true for every possible function q. Since E is an expectation operator, if I square the function q, it's a non-negative function. And thus, the expectation of q square must be non-negative. Again, simple. And finally, since um, uh, the constant function must get the expectation 1, we can also check that E maps the constant function 1 into 1. We know that E is a linear operator. And therefore, it is enough to specify it, specify its action on any basis of uh, functions, which are just polynomials here. So in particular, if I choose the monomial basis, it is enough to specify the action of E on all monomials. And since we have uh, this uh, Boolean-ness constraint here, it's in fact enough to specify the action of E only on multilinear monomials, which corresponds to giving just the multilinear moments of this distribution mu. Okay. So these are all the things that you all know, but I just wanted to recap them because I'm going to go to somewhat modification of this very soon. Um, so, uh, so what's the issue with this uh, picture? Well, because we don't usually have uh, unbounded uh, power algorithms, we want to sort of understand what a bounded algorithm would do, computationally bounded algorithm would do. Okay. So uh, let's say the supercomputer Titan is what we are interested in finding out uh, uh, the power of or uh, more specifically, the SOS algorithm run on it. So uh, this algorithm would probably not be able to find a distribution on the solutions. Instead, it would come up with some related objects called it the pseudo distribution. And we'll define what it means very soon. In some sense, our attempt is to define mu tilde is in some sense a relaxation of the actual distribution mu supported on cliques before. Okay? And again, we will think of this tilde mu which is not going to be an actual distribution, but still we'll think of it as capturing the knowledge of omega cliques in the graph G, but now of a computationally bounded agent, which is the SOS algorithm here. Okay? So let's see what changes in the slide uh, of properties that we noted down before. Um, the first thing we need to remind ourselves that the objects we are dealing with are all pretend objects. So let's add a tilde to the notation. So there is tilde E and tilde mu now. And to the names, we'll add the pseudo to remind ourselves that we are not dealing with actual moments or actual distributions. So we'll have pseudo expectations, pseudo moments, and pseudo distributions. And so far, the slide is exactly the same as before. The only constraint that I'm going to add to this slide is that whenever I compute the pseudo expectation, the polynomial I compute it at should be of degree at most d. So basically, all the properties that I wrote down should be true whenever the 
the pseudo expectation that I'm computing is of degree at most d. Okay? So in particular, if q here is of degree at most d minus 1, then for any such q, the, uh, the first equality would hold. Similarly, for example, if q is of degree at most d over 2, then uh, this p as in s inequality sh should hold. Okay? So in particular, degree d pseudo expectation would satisfy all these uh, constraints so long as the polynomial it applies to is of degree at most d. Great. So uh, what's the upshot of this? Well, we basically have forced our pseudo distribution to satisfy only a subset of constraints that actual distribution satisfy. But what we gain is that, first of all, this operator is now specified by just a n to the o of d bunch of numbers, because I only have to specify low degree moments of it. And in fact, it turns out that we can use a simple SDP to compute if such an operator exists, we can compute such an operator that satisfies all the three kinds of constraints in n to the o of d time. And this. Yes, yes. Uh, the, so any any uh, linear operator that satisfies all these constraints for degree at most d polynomials. Okay. So if if such an operator exists, then we can compute it using n to the o of d time semi referent program. And that algorithm is basically this SDP is basically what we call the sum of squares algorithm. Oh, it's a pseudo distribution. Yes, yes. Uh, this is the typo. This should be a pseudo distribution. But you don't need any data. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's mainly for intuition at this point. So what happens if the SDP returns null? Like, what happens if it says that there is no such operator? So uh, in whenever we have Boolean constraints, uh, strong duality holds. And what you can show is that if there is no pseudo expectation that satisfies the constraints, then there is a proof of unsatisfiability of these three equations, which can be written in a very specific form. Okay? So in particular, such a proof is known as a sum of squares proof, or a sum of squares refutation of this system of equations. And this proof consists of the following uh, objects. So it basically, this proof consists of two polynomials, f and g, both of degree at most d, such that f is 0 on all solutions to uh, this system of equations. Okay? So f is 0 on omega cliques here. And g is a sum of squares of degree at most d over 2 polynomials. And f plus g add up to minus 1. So it is, yeah, this is an identity. Yes, f plus g as a polynomial should equal the constant polynomial minus 1. Okay. So, it's, it, so if such a proof exists, it's easy to see that these equations are unsatisfiable. The reason being, suppose there is an x that satisfies all these equations, right? Then fx has to be 0 gx has to be uh, non-negative, while on the left-hand side you have a negative number. So there, there cannot exist any such x. But the nice thing about this proof is that it not only rules out actual distributions or actual solutions, it also rules out degree d pseudo distributions. Okay? So in particular, suppose there is a degree d pseudo distribution that satisfies all these three constraints. Then if you compute it at f, this requires one piece of argument, but if you compute it at f, you'll get a 0. If you compute it at g, because it's a sum of squares, you would get a non-negative number. While by linearity and normalization, the left-hand side should get minus 1. So again, you have a contradiction, which means that there is no such pseudo expectation. So, so, so this is a nice proof, because it rules out uh, the existence of all degree pseudo expectations. And what you can show is that whenever there is no pseudo expectation that satisfies this constraint, such a proof always exists, in, in when, whenever at least you have the Boolean axioms. OK, so that's basically my small overview of the sum of squares algorithm. Before going ahead, let's just see what it means to prove lower bounds. In particular, what does it mean to prove a lower bound on the planet leak problem? So what we'll show, or our goal is for the rest of the talk, is to show the following. Fix d to be some big constant, and fix omega to be something that approaches square root of n. Then we want to show that there is a pseudo expectation that satisfies all these three constraints with high probability when g is drawn from the random graph distribution. Okay. Now, we already saw that a random graph has clique of size at most 2 log n with high probability. But basically, what you're showing is that there is a pseudo expectation that pretends as if there is a square root n size clique, roughly square root n size clique in the random graph. And <coughs> so um, one complaint that you can have is that this has nothing to do with planted clique at this point. But the observation is that if I now add a, if I now plant a clique on this random graph, I only reduce the number of constraints. 
which means that if I construct such a pseudo expectation, which is high with high probability satisfies all the constraints, etc., that it will continue to remain feasible even when I add a clique to it. So in particular, if you add a clique of say smaller than root n size, the algorithm will continue to think that there's a root n size clique in it, and that's your integrality gap. Okay. So so this is going to be our goal for the rest of the talk. Okay, to construct such a pseudo expectation. Ah, you're saying that the lower bound is for this particular way of setting up the SOS algorithm. That's correct. Well, for, for all these relaxations, yes. Because in some sense, even linear programming is p-complete. So if you don't restrict your formulations, then in some sense, you're asking a lower bound on computation. Well, yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, you, you would say that this is canonical, but then maybe you come up with some crazy reduction and then some bunch of equalities that capture it. Yes. Yes. No, you're right. In particular, if you go to problems in OR, for example, some price collecting version of some approximation problem, then you have so many constraints that there is, in fact, a choice of what relaxation you want to choose. And they have frequently results uh, come up where they use a different LP or a different SDP, which gives them a different uh, approximation factor. It really does happen. For some of these problems, they are, in some sense, simple enough to describe that it appears like the natural relaxation is the best. But once you like get to somewhat, somewhat more complicated settings, uh, even coming up with uh, what should be a natural relaxation is not that clear. Yes, yes. In fact, I'll come to that. That's an important perspective. Yes. <coughs> okay. So, uh, so hopefully uh, you understand what SOS algorithm does for the clique problem now. So let's see the first attempt at uh, coming up with the pseudo distribution that should somehow uh, pretend as if there is a root n size clique in a random graph. And this was by MW. So, okay. So to describe a pseudo distribution or a pseudo expectation operator, I just have to give its values to you on monomials of degree at most d. Okay. So um, there is no clique in the random graph, which is omega of size omega with high probability. But let's, let's imagine that there is a clique like that, because at least the algorithm is imagining. So what is this function xs? Right? This takes the value 1. If, if x were the indicator of this clique c, then xs takes the value 1 if s is completely contained inside c. Okay? In other words, if this were a real expectation, then what you're computing really is the probability that this set s is contained inside the clique c drawn from your distribution. OK? So this is clearly bullshit, but then it's, it's supposed to help you to come up with some reasonable values for these monomials. OK? So let's pretend like we are an SOS algorithm and we think there is a clique in it. How would you come up with values for a random graph, which look like there is a, which make you look like there is a root n size clique in it? So you can reason like this. You could say that, well, it's a random graph. Every vertex is symmetric. There is no difference between every vertex. So in some sense, every vertex is equally likely to be in this fake clique. And since you want some xi equals omega, the only choice uh, you're left with is that some xi, uh, the, the pseudo expectation of xi should be about omega over n. 
Okay? You can push this reasoning somewhat further. You would say that, look, if I want to define it for a monomial xi times xj, if ij is not an edge, then they cannot, then i and j together cannot belong to any clique. Thus, the pseudo probability of i and j together belonging to the fake clique is zero. On the other hand, if ij is an edge, then again I want to somehow think that in a random graph, no edge is special. All edges should in some sense be treated equally and arrive at numbers which are like 2 times omega squared over n squared. And in general, if I push this reasoning, then I would get some, some normalization, which is a constant for our purposes because s is at most d for us. Uh, and the value would be that if s is not a clique, then it can't be contained in any bigger clique, which means that the pseudo expectation of xs must be 0 and omega over n to the size of s otherwise. Now, these are not really the numbers that MW came up with, but for all our purposes today and all the conclusions that we will draw, these numbers would give us the same conclusion as the actual MW numbers because these are basically equal up to some small uh, update factor uh, to the MW uh, moments. So in particular, uh, they are off by only 1 plus minus uh, big O of 1 over square root n. Okay? The main problem is that they don't satisfy the equations, but uh, they could be made. Exactly, yes. So, so the, these numbers, uh, yes, that, that's a great point. So the numbers that I came up with don't satisfy the equations exactly. They're close to satisfying them, but not quite. And if you want to force them to satisfy the equation, then you have to do include an update factor which looks like this. But this update will really not bother us with our conclusions today. So I'm going to basically avoid, at some point I'll forget both this constant factor in front of omega over into the s and also this update factor. Okay? So, so for the purpose of this talk, you can think of the pseudo expectation as just omega over into the size of s if s is a clique and zero otherwise. Okay? So, uh, so I told you that this strategy is not enough to prove a lower bound, and let's see why. What, what goes wrong with this strategy? Yes. 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 Correct. Yes. Yeah. So what I meant was that it's not enough to give us the conjecture that we want. So uh, let's see why. Let's see exactly what's going to go wrong uh, when we use this strategy to um, uh, try to prove the conjecture. OK, so in particular, John Kellner showed that there is, a, there is a very simple to describe degree 2 polynomial p, which is a function of the graph g, such that when omega exceeds n to the 1 third, then with high probability over the draw of the random graph, the MW pseudo expectation of p squared is negative. In particular, there is a simple certificate for why the MW pseudo expectation is not PSD when omega exceeds n to the one third. And as Avi said, you can prove a lower bound if the clique size you are shooting for was omega equals n to the one third roughly. But if you want to prove, for example, uh, n to the point four nine size lower bound at even degree four, then this theorem tells you that MW strategy will not succeed. Okay, and you can in fact generalize this to higher d, and what you wh what you get is that. The, the point at which uh, the MW construction begins to fail to be a PSD uh, becomes lower and lower. So for smaller and smaller clique sizes, it begins to fail. So in other words, you're far off from root n as you go higher in degree. OK? Yeah, I, 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 so. Yes. 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 Right. Yes. 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 So, so, uh, so as I was saying, it, it, yes. Yes. 
has to hold for every polynomial of degree at most d over 2. Okay, but he shows the specific polynomial. Yeah, that's, yes. the that's why it doesn't work. Okay, so he shows the polynomial. If you want, yeah, for yes. a low bound that's too high, like above n to the third, which it cannot be obtained because <laughs> one polynomial is not, does not have a positive expectation. Yes. So the Pseudo distribution is not good enough, at least for such high low bounds. Yes. Right. So, uh, I'm not going to show you a proof of this theorem today. Instead, what I'm going to give you are two separate observations, related but separate observations, which should hopefully convince you that there is something fishy with the construction. Um, the proof of this theorem itself, after these observations is especially, is going to be really simple. But I'm not going to go to that, because I think I want to focus on the intuition behind these two observations, because it's going to be our guiding principle in constructing the operator that actually does work. OK, um, Okay. so let's, let's go to the first uh, observation that I want to make about this MW moments. And this brings me back to the distinguishability version of the problem that Avi was mentioning before. OK, so uh, let me take a detour and describe this problem. The planted leak problem is supposed to be hard in a very strong way. Okay? Or at least we think it's hard in a stronger way than what we've been talking of so far. In particular, consider the following relaxation of the problem. Okay, suppose I, uh, I I give you a graph, and I promise you that it is sampled from one of the two distributions. One is the standard GN half distribution, the random graph distribution, and the other is this planted distribution where you first choose a random graph and an omega uh, a uniformly random set of omega on them. And I don't tell you which. Can you come up with an algorithm which, with high probability, correctly tells me which distribution I use to sample the graph? Okay, and it turns out that all what we know about this problem is consistent with even this problem becoming hard when omega goes lower than root n. Okay? Clearly, this is a relaxation because if you could solve, you could find the clique, then you can certainly distinguish between the two, but the other way around need not be true. On the other hand, we believe that even this question is hard. Okay? So um, suppose that you thought that even for the SOS algorithm, even this distinguishability version of the question should be hard, not just the clique problem that we have been writing down so far. Okay? So this is like failing in a stronger way. And let's say we, we expect the sum of squares algorithm also to fail in this strong way. Okay? So if, if we made that our gold standard, then we would also want that our pseudo expectation should pretend not only like there is a root n size click in the graph, but also to pretend as if the graph itself was sampled from GNF omega. Okay? This, has, this, this need not be true at all, but suppose you were shooting for this, and suppose you thought that all efficient algorithms, including the SOS algorithm, should fail to solve this distinguishability version of the problem, then you would expect that the operator that you construct should also pretend as if the graph itself was drawn from GN of omega. Okay? And now you can see where I'm going with this. I'm going to argue that the MW construction doesn't, well, it's, there, is a, there is a simple test that will distinguish, uh, that, will, that will tell us that uh, the construction doesn't really pretend that the graph is drawn from GN of omega. Of course, I, one uh, caveat here is that I, I cannot really pretend that the graph is from GN of omega because of course it is not. So in some sense, we are looking for some simple test that we can fool. We want to pretend that our graph is from GN of omega for, with respect to some simple test. And we'll see what this means in a moment. But I'm going to give you an arguably simple test, which would at least appear simple which will tell us that this is not true for the MW construction. Okay? So, um, so for the purpose of this argument, parameterize omega as epsilon times square root n. So what we are shooting for is where epsilon is about 1 over polylog n, let's say. And let's say that I tell you that the graph that you are looking at, the degree of the first vertex in the graph is square root n higher than its mean. So in a random graph, the deviation would be about square root n. So basically, I'm saying that let's say the degree of the first vertex happened to be about one standard deviation above its mean. Right? And let's call this event, event d. Okay? So now, uh, I can compute the following quantity. I can compute the average pseudo probability that the first vertex is contained inside the fake planted clique conditioned on the event d. Okay? That's just the average pseudo expectation of x1 conditioned on d averaged out over g. 
So this is somewhat confusing, so let me just make it clear and parse it out for you. This pseudo expectation of x1 is a function of the graph. Because for each graph, you have one pseudo expectation operator. So this, this pseudo expectation of x1 is some number, but it depends on the graph. Now you are averaging this number with this distribution on the graph condition that condition on the fact that this event d happens okay and this is not really hard to compute because the mw construction really doesn't depend that uh, at least for singletons it doesn't really depend uh, on this event d very much in particular we saw that uh, up to this 1 plus minus big o of 1 over square root n factor uh, the expectation of xi would be basically just omega over n which means that uh, even in even on an average condition on this event d we would get something like omega over n 1 plus big o of 1 over square root n okay so so this this part is simple now what i want to claim is that if i now compute the analogous average on this planted distribution yeah, then i you are looking at this expression right so let, let, let me let me uh, uh, let me explain it this way right if if the vertex has higher degree in the graph a priori you would expect that it is more likely to be in the imagined clique of yours than otherwise right so we are trying to find out what kind of effect does it make like quantitatively estimate how should the pseudo expectation change if we knew that the degree of the first vertex was somewhat higher than average okay so we can first try to estimate what happens to the MW pseudo expectation, right? So I can ask in the MW pseudo probability distribution, what, how, what is the average of the pseudo probability that first vertex is contained inside the clique, condition on the event that the first vertex has degree root n higher than its mean, okay? And this is easy to estimate. It is about omega over n times one plus big O of one over square root n, just because the expression does not really depend on this event d very much. Okay, does, 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 does that make sense now? Does this quantity make sense? Okay, you are saying it does not ignore the condition on d. Because, because the pseudo, yes. Exactly. Right. So now I can try. We are trying to find out how much of a difference does it make. Yes, that's what I'm trying to argue. Yes, and I'm trying to estimate if it makes a big difference. It it might be that it, it makes a difference, but very tiny one, and then maybe you're fine. But then I'm trying to argue that this is not true. Yes, exactly, and we're trying to estimate by how much, right? So, to to sort of formalize this intuition, we are going to now work out a similar expression, but on the planted distribution. So I can compute the average probability. Now there is no pseudo. I can compute the average probability that the first vertex belongs to this clique C when H is the graph sample from this planted distribution. Okay? And I'm going to show it to you that it is going to be about omega over n times 1 plus 2 epsilon. Okay? And this epsilon, remember, is 1 over polylog. So the point I want to make is that this expression is much higher than this expression in 1 when omega approaches square root n. Yes. Yeah, it's not pretending as if the graph was drawn from this new distribution J nap omega. Now, it's not going to pretend with respect to all possible tests, but I want to argue that degree test is a test, and we'll make this we we'll make this formal very soon. But the point is that degree is a simple test. We expect all polynomial time algorithms to sort of reason based on degree. But then, if you do, then you get this discrepancy. Okay. Great. So uh, let me do this quickly. This uh, second calculation now. Okay. Okay. So, and this is not a hard calculation at all. So, say you are drawing h comma c from this planted distribution g n half omega. So, if you don't see the graph, if you, if you don't see anything in the graph, then the prior that you have, which is what is the probability, what is the prior probability that the first vertex is contained in the clique? This is exactly omega over n. And now things are all uh, right things. I mean, there are no pretend things anymore, right? We are working on an actual distribution. Okay. Now let's see. I show you that the degree of the first vertex is n over two plus delta, and this delta is going to be like uh, square root n for us. So now I can ask you, what is the posterior probability that the first vertex is contained in the clique C 
condition on the event D. Exactly. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, and we are going to some commandments of the church very soon. So, <laughs> um, okay. No, that's not the word. This I agree. It's not the word for this. But that's a low bar. <laughs> Okay, so now I can use Bayes rule, right? And what does Bayes rule tell me? Well, I just, so uh, the Bayes rule is basically going to codify the intuition that the distribution of this degree changes when, based on whether the first vertex is contained in the clique uh, or not, right? So I can, I can estimate that pr quite precisely. Again, I'm going to use sloppy approximations all over now. If first vertex is not in the clique C, then the degree of the vertex behaves like just a uh, Gaussian random variable with mean n over 2 and variance n over 4 just a random graph uh, distribution of the degree. On the other hand, if the first vertex is contained in the clique C, then the degree gets a bump of omega in the mean. The reason being that every vertex in this clique is going to be a neighbor of the first vertex now. And the variance and uh, other parts really don't change that much. I mean, I'm ignoring all small of one factors all around. Okay, so there is a distribution, there is a difference in the distribution and basically Bayes rule tells you how this distribution manifests in the posterior probability. You can apply that. And I'm not going to bore you with the computation. It, it, it basically gives you some exponential update after this Gaussian approximation. And if you just take the first order term from the exponential that you get, you get that you need an update of 1 plus 2 times delta times omega over n. Okay, I really don't expect you to follow these calculations. So uh, I want you to stare at only this final expression. And delta is about square root n for us, which means that um, we should have what we wanted, which is that an update factor of 1 plus 2 epsilon over this prior. Okay. Uh, again, this is not a hard calculation, but probably not the best use of uh, time here. So, so hopefully I've convinced you that the discrepancy does really exist. If, if, if at all you are shooting for this loftier goal of your pseudo expectation pretending to be that the graph is from GN of omega. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not, well, I, I can come to it later. Yeah, I have, I have a slide for it. Uh, maybe I'll come to it once I have uh, completed the talk. I can show you the actual argument too. It's not hard at all. Uh, but not from this, but what I'm going to show you next, OK? So uh, that's a great question, by the way, because uh, all we have shown so far is that they look fishy, but looking fishy is not a big deal. I mean. Exactly, yeah. Uh, yes. In fact, they don't look fishy at all if omega were smaller than n to the one third. Yeah. They, they look fine. So this, this, this whole. They don't look fine. They look fishy still, but they Ah, yes. Control. Yeah, I mean, they, they work, but uh, they, they still, they, this argument continues to hold even for smaller omega. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, the religion uh, is not really perfect. <laughs> um, Most of it is retrospective. You'll see what we actually did in a moment. We actually did something very, yeah. We, we did many ugly things before coming here. So uh, the main question is, uh, well, th there is something fishy going on, but then uh, we don't care about that. We want to know whether this algorithm that we're interested in notices the discrepancy and gets us a negative polynomial, right? So what I'm going to show you next is not really a negative polynomial, but something that is close enough. I'm going to show you that there is a polynomial Q of degree 4 in the clique indicator variables, such that if you compute this polynomial Q at any indicator of an omega clique, then you get a large value about omega to the 5. On the other hand, if you compute the MW pseudo expectation of Q, then you get a value which is n times omega squared with high probability over the random graph distribution. Okay? So, so let's see, see what, what the point I'm trying to make is the following. If 
this Q on every indicator of an omega clique has value at least omega to the 5. Now, if MW pseudo expectation is trying to pretend that uh, the, the support of the underlying pseudo distribution is on omega cliques, then you expect that the pseudo expression should also be about omega to the 5. But then this polynomial tells you that uh, this is not true, it is not really pretending well, right. And the problem is that n times omega squared is much, much smaller than omega to the 5 when omega exceeds n to the 1 third. And that is precisely the same uh, point where the con moments, continue, mo moments uh, tend to break, okay. So, uh, uh, let us see what this polynomial is. Again, not very hard. Uh, to define this polynomial, I need to define this uh, n-dimensional vector for every vertex. So, let us say you have an i s vertex in the graph. This is not a complicated vector. It is just the plus minus 1 neighborhood indicator of the vertex i. So, at j s vertex, r i takes the value plus 1 if i j is an edge. It takes the value minus 1 if i j is not an edge. And 0 that uh, this polynomial computes the value omega to the 5, right. And why is that? Let us look at in fact a single, uh, uh, let us look at the expression which is the fourth power for some fixed vertex i here, okay. So, you have uh, the inner product of r i with x raised to the power 4. Now, i is in omega. Yeah, now, now fix an i which is, yes, yes. So, fix an i says that x i is 1 which means that i is a vertex in the clique that x indicates. Then the inner product of r i and x is exactly omega minus 1. The reason being that r i takes a value plus 1 on every j that is a neighbor of i. In particular, every vertex in the clique indicated by x is going to be a neighbor of i. So, you have plus 1s there and x is 0 otherwise anyway. So, which means that if you take the fourth power, this is roughly omega to the 4. And now, there are omega such vertices, which means that this value of q of x at any indicator of omega clique should be at least omega to the 5. So, so far so good. Let us our calculation. Well, not really hard, but somewhat more notation intensive. Um, Let us compute the m w pseudo expectation of q and show that it is n times omega squared up to some constants with high probability. Okay. So, I am what I am going to show you is only that this holds with some constant probability with some big constant here, but this actually holds with high probability. We will not go into that today. So, let us begin by computing the average value of this pseudo expectation averaged out over the graph g drawn at random from g and half. Okay, so, you, you want to prove something with high probability, we are going to compute the expectation. And let us look at one of the terms here. So, one of the one of the fourth powers here. I can expand this polynomial out as a sum over 4 tuples a, b, c, d. And now, take uh, uh, the coefficient here would be r i of a, r i of b, r i of c and r i of d and I get the monomial x a, x p, x c, x d and this is the sum over all possible choices of a, b, c, d. Okay. Great. So, now this tilde e operator acts on x variable. So, I can push it all the way in and apply it to the monomial in x and by linearity I can push this expectation over g inside this summation over a, b, c, d. Okay. So, now here is the point at least in this approximate way that we define m w, the pseudo expectation of this monomial x a, x p, x c, x d, which is a function of the graph is independent of this red edges. If, if i is different from a, b, c, d and you consider this edges i a, i b, i c, i d, this r i a, r i b, r i c, r i d is just the parity of these red edges, right. And uh, we, are, we are thinking of this edges as the plus minus one indicator variable. So, you are taking the parity of these edges. And this so this coefficient is just the parity, but the point is that uh, the the pseudo expectation of this monomial on ABCD is independent of this red edges completely. In particular, independent of the parity of them. Okay, uh, and notice that I cannot be a part of ABCD because if it is, then because we forced R I of I to be zero, will the expression itself will become zero. That's a great point. Yes. So, so the so so uh, the the point is that even if you compute the second power, you get some discrepancy. They're not the exactly same expressions. 
but uh, somehow SOS won't be able to detect that discrepancy. You want the numbers to be low? Yeah. Yeah, we would, have, like, we would have wanted to take two, but we know it can't exist. Like, such a polynomial cannot exist because we can prove a root and lower bound at degree two. Okay, so six is not better than four. Yeah, six is worse. Bas so I'll, I'll tell you what it implies. But it doesn't, the gap is. The gap is even larger. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you, t if you take six powers, this argument can be generalized and you will get some other discrepancy. But four is the smallest number where you can get some discrepancy and also get a negative polynomial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So you take the six, but then the, the, your result is not as good. That's right. Okay, so you have some yeah. small numbers. Yeah. And also, so what you're hinting is that this distribution that we're trying to imitate is this gap distribution. Which planted distribution. Yes. Distribution. Why can't you take the moments of this distribution? They, they don't satisfy the equation. Uh, that's a great question. We are probably going to do something similar. That, that's a great point, and uh, hopefully, uh, yeah, hopefully your question would be answered in two or three slides. See, in the end, I have to give you a way to compute pseudo expectation for a given graph, right? And one of the hard constraints I have is that if S is not a clique in the graph that I see, then I cannot really use any value but 0, right? Yes. So in, in particular, if you compute things for the planted distribution, you only get one sequence of numbers. They don't really depend on the graph at all, right? And they would break down. But but the idea is quite sound, and we will we'll do we will try to implement something similar. In fact, okay. So uh, let's go on to our computation, the more interesting part. Sorry, probably not the more interesting part here. Okay. So so the point I was trying to make is that the pseudo expectation of this monomial, which is a function of the graph, happens to be independent of these red edges. Which means I can uh, write this as a product of expectations over G. And now the point is that this expectation is going to be 0 unless this parity completely cancels out. Okay? And the dominant term happens to be when ABCD is a set of size exactly 2, which means there are two repetitions. And this is an artifact of the, the choice, the, the end of the choice, right? the fact that it's independent. Yes, exactly. In fact, I'm trying to argue that it should not be independent. So uh, yes, to make the MW choice, then you get independence. And now you're forced to basically conclude that there are at most n square, uh, the, uh, n square different choices in this summation. So you get some n square. And each is a degree 2 monomial now. Because of multilinearity, you can reduce the degree uh, to 4, because there are only two, four, two distinct uh, uh, vertices in ABCD. Which means that this moment, this uh, pseudo expectation is going to look like, like omega squared over n squared up to first order terms. And there are n squared such terms, which means that this evaluates to about omega squared. And now there were n such terms in the beginning, this sum over i, which means that, and each of them will behave similarly and give you, give you an omega squared, which means that the average value over the graph of this pseudo expectation of q is n times omega squared with some constants. And now you can do some Markov to conclude that, at least with a constant probability, the MW pseudo expectation of Q is ap at most some constant times n times omega squared. Okay, and as I showed you, this is a problem because it's too low. Okay. Okay. So, so th those were my two. Uh, uh, those were my two hints at why something is going wrong with the MW moments. We'll try to sort of uh, make sense of them very soon. But one thing you could try uh, right away. Yes. Yes. Uh, no. 
And in fact, that's the slide I'm going to show you now. So it, yeah, the religion is not perfect. <laughs> so I in fact, I'm going to tell you very, very strong, something very strong. So one thing that if you were brave enough uh, and bold enough to fool yourself, you could say that somehow maybe this is the only bad polynomial with, M with MW. Right? You, you could start with that assumption. And you could try to modify your moments so that this polynomial gets a higher value. Right? In fact, gets value something like omega to the 5. If, if you could do that, maybe, maybe things are all right. And at least to begin with, you could try that. So we did. And we just modified it precisely according to this calculation before. And it amounts to some update. It doesn't matter what the update is. But basically, this update is precisely designed to push this polynomial pseudo expectation up to omega to the 5. Okay? And at this point, you can ask, OK, well, this, does this work? Does this give us a root and lower bound? So the answer is yes. <laughs> So in particular, answering your question that there is no other negative polynomial. Uh, so, so basically, the proof consists of showing two points I that. Say, that was not my question. Ah. My question was, uh, suppose there was a, I mean, just uh, you got stuck in a particular direction in which uh, you, you got a polynomial which is too high on the whatever, positive example. Yes. And uh, low on the negative example. Yes. Suppose it was the other way around. It would still be a problem. Yes. 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 Any discrepancy should. Yes. Yeah. We'll, we'll in fact try to sort of formalize that intuition in a moment. I'm taking somewhat more time than usual. <laughs> okay. So um, okay. So we modify this, and uh, then something really magical happens to us. Uh, we get lucky, and somehow we can show that Q is the only bad polynomial for the MW moment at degree four. And the other thing you have to worry about is if I fix it, I could somehow start breaking other polynomials because. Now my moments are not really MW, right? There are some modifications. So maybe some new polynomials break for it. So you must show that something, you must show something similar to saying that fixing Q doesn't cause new problems. Okay? And both those things happen to be true. It's, it's, it's a complicated proof, but essentially you can implement both, to both these points and get the proof at degree 4. Okay? Ah, good point. So. Uh, this problems is a vaguely defined term. Let's say the pro by here, the problems, we only mean that uh, there are no negative uh, polynomials. You're right. I mean, the discrepancies will remain. The discrepancy between the planted distribution and the actual distribution will remain. Yeah, but what I'm saying is that some of your objectives will be that this new moment appears. Yes. Just yes. So in particular, they don't create new problems. Yes. Problems, uh, ah, right. Well, uh, so. Uh, so uh, yeah, I thought that you meant that the problem should probably mean that there are no discrepancies. But there might still be discrepancies. In fact, I think there are. It's just that those, those discrepancies don't cause us to produce new negative polynomials. OK, so if you are braver than this, you would suspect that you could try to repeat this strategy for higher degrees. You could come up with what are the bad polynomials for MW, fix them, and hopefully nothing bad happens. Hopefully fixing them is enough. Uh, that doesn't work. So what happens is that even at degree 6, there are multiple families of polynomials. And we tried that. We tried to fix them. But in any reasonable way of fixing them, you encounter new bad polynomials because of this correction, which you fix. Then you keep spiraling out. You keep fixing some polynomials, but then there are new problems that create. And in some sense, maybe you can argue that this process will terminate, but we weren't able to. So that didn't work. Um, but it also was a very ad hoc way. And if it, if it would have worked, it would have been terribly unsatisfying. So it's nice that it didn't work. And we now need a more principled approach to constructing the pseudo distribution. We can't really just do this in this ad hoc way. Okay, And that brings us to the last point, which is the Bayesian pseudo distribution. So, okay, so, so far, maybe I have convinced you that in some sense, at least for large omega, our pseudo expectation must respect the kind of Bayesian constraints we get out of reasoning about degrees. Okay, In particular, Let's say you take the highest degree vertex in G. So G is a random graph with high probability. The highest degree vertex will have a degree about n over 2 plus square root n, or maybe some constant time square root n. And therefore, the argument we made before uh, would show that uh, there would be a discrepancy if I compute the MW pseudo expectation of x top of G and average it out over the random graph. For the discrepancy to not exist, therefore, I must force that the average pseudo probability that the top vertex in G is in, is in this, is in this uh, fake clique that we're imagining should be equal 
uh, to the average probability that the top vertex in the graph H is contained in the clique C. Okay, so, I am going to give you a minute to stare, but the idea is that, so remember this discrepancy that we had here. We had this discrepancy between the average pseudo probability of the first vertex being contained in the clique condition on this uh, event D and the average probability of first vertex being contained in the clique in the planted distribution, again condition on the same event. right? So, the conditioning is somehow now captured by saying that we are looking at the top vertex. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Why just look at the top vertex? If there is nothing very special about degree, I could take the lowest degree vertex and then take the monomial x top times x bot, which is a degree 2 monomial. This, this is a degree 2 polynomial, which is a function of the graph, by the way. Now, I would if, if I sort of want to repeat the argument that I showed you for uh, based on degree, then I would want that the average pseudo probability that the topmost and the bottommost vertex of G are contained in the clique C should be roughly equal if I replace X by the indicator of this clique C and G by the graph H and then take expectations over the planted distribution. And what I am hinting at is that all these top bot seem like simple enough statistics that S SOS should be able to reason about or at least if you are trying to be Bayesian, then you would be, you should uh, try to satisfy these constraints. And I could go on and let us say for example, take monomials with the top edges and then try to uh, take the top edge meaning uh, the edge that is contained in at, uh, the maximum number of triangles in G and try to write a similar statement about them. right? And I could go on like this. In some sense, I want an operator that satisfies all these constraints together. right? All these and many more maybe. Okay? So, we want to somehow formalize this into some principle that we can follow. right? So, that brings us uh, to the Bayesian religion, which has this one commandment which is that if you are going to resign pseudo expectations, they shall satisfy all simple Bayesian constraints. Okay? So, uh, like a good commandment is vague enough uh, that it does not mean anything. So, uh, <laughs> I am going to try to make it uh, formal, so that we can actually apply it. So, and, uh, and yeah, what does the neighbor mean? But um, okay, so uh, here is one attempt at it. So up to some definition of simple, which I have left unclear so far. Let's take a map that takes the graph and gives us a polynomial that depends on the graph and is a polynomial in X. Okay. So remember that this is trying to generalize this situation. This X top G is a polynomial of degree one, which depends on the graph because the top vertex is a function of the graph. Okay. So we want that for every such map if I take the average of the pseudo expectation of PG of X, then it should be no different if I now compute the quantity by replacing X by the actual clique indicator C, indicator of C and replace this G by H and take expectations over the planted distribution. Okay? So, so, this is basically trying to generalize these equations that we wrote down and I have replaced this polynomials that I came up with in an ad hoc way with some general map that maps G into some polynomial in X. Okay? So, that seems like uh, good enough for us. Uh, Let us try to define what simple means now. Now, I can think of graph as just a bit vector of n choose two dimensions, each, each bit telling me whether some edge is present or not. And I want to use the, say it again. It's the indicator. Is the zero one indicator of the set C, right? So, so basically, the type check matches, right? X was supposed to be the zero one indicator of this imagined clique. On this side, you have an actual clique. So, you replace X by the indicator vector of this clique C, and you replace the graph by the actual graph that you have. But now there is an actual clique in it. So, you take the expectation over this distribution. Okay. So, I can now look at the graph G as some bit vector of n choose two dimensions. And the graph is described by this gij variables for every pair of vertices. gij takes the value plus one if ij is an edge in g and minus one otherwise. So I, I so so okay. So I'm basically trying to uh, define what simple means. Every such polynomial now can actually be seen as a polynomial in both x and this gij variables. 
because any function on the graph is just a polynomial in this gij variables right and therefore i can define two kinds of degrees of this polynomial i can define the solution degree which is the degree seen as a polynomial in x i can define the instance degree which is degree of pg seen as a polynomial in gij variables and then i can define simple uh, as uh, a map pg where both the instance and solution degrees are low okay so what does low mean well remember that the solution degree is really fixed to be d that we are shooting for and this instance degree would be some function of d it's going to be slightly super constant like say d log log n okay but both are going to be small that's that's what we're going to aim for so we want to satisfy this constraint for all low solution and instance degree maps we want to force that there be no discrepancy and uh, observe that i have in fact become even bolder i want to now satisfy them with exact equality because if i can do that then why not okay okay so let's let me just uh, see what this implies and this implies a very nice thing in a moment now okay this should be minus 1 1 to the n just 2 the pseudo expectation of xs is a function on the graph therefore it's a function on the n two two dimensional hypercube that maps into the real values i can write its fourier transform right and now a very simple consequence an immediate consequence of this commandment that you force yourself to follow is that all the low degree fourier coefficients of pseudo expectation of xs are completely determined just because uh the pseudo expectation the, the fourier coefficient of pseudo expectation of xs at t is some expectation over the graph uh, of some simple function and i can go use this equivalence to define it as some expectation of a related function over the planted distribution which is just some fixed number now so the low degree coefficients of all of my pseudo expectations are completely fixed and i'm going to make the arbitrary choice that just i'm going to kill the high degree part off once i do that i have basically no choice in the operator okay so and and then that's going to be that's going to be the pseudo expectation we use it is some truncated fourier polynomial uh for every pseudo moment okay now we just came up with this operator in some weird hacky way why why should it satisfy all, uh, the constraints why should it be nice in any way at all but it turns out that it satisfies all the constraints in fact it's not even hard to show now, the main technical lemma of course is that this operator is psd in that for every polynomial q of degree at most d over 2 you can show that the pseudo expectation of q squared is non negative with high probability when the graph is drawn at random so uh I'm going to spend only one minute telling you about what this lemma's proof looks like. Um, as is usual with almost all such proofs, we are going to look at the moment matrix, which is some associated matrix with this pseudo distribution, and showing that tilde e is PSD is equivalent to showing that m is PSD. This matrix, this matrix is indexed by sets of size at most d, and the ijth entry is the pseudo expectation of the monomial x at i union j. now what we do and this is a extremely high level view but what we can do is we can uh, do some approximate eigen eigen split of this matrix m and collect pieces together to form a structured part and a random part okay so what do we mean by this uh, objects the structured part would would basically be the part where approximately speaking the eigen vectors are going to be low degree functions of the graph okay remember that this matrix itself is a function of the graph So we are going to split it into structured and random, where the structured part looks like eigen, where the structured part has eigen vectors which are low degree functions, and the random part would be the eigen vector which are high degree functions. Okay. Now the observation or something that you could hope to uh, have is that the low degree parts of the uh, low degree part of the moment matrix should be fine and in fact PSD by just the construction because our operator is designed to be nice on low degree Fourier coefficients. is designed to in fact mimic this gn half omega which is an actual distribution so you could expect that you can get lucky and something nice would happen for the low degree parts of the matrix and what you should expect is that the random part should really behave like random okay so the high degree part should behave like random and it turns out that this in fact intuition can be codified and you can sort of uh, show that uh, this random part restricted to various correct subspaces looks just like a wigner matrix and you can bound it against the big eigen values that the structured part gives you there anyway so with that you can obtain the main theorem which is that for any constant d this bayesian pseudo distribution in fact is psd whenever omega is uh, slightly less than uh, root n huh 
Ah, yeah. No. Yeah, yeah. We we don't use the Johnson scheme. Yes, yes. So in particular, we don't really split into expectation and uh, deviation part like MW do. Okay. Okay. So let me just end with two conclusions. One is that this procedure to prove lower bounds is actually very general. So Avi was telling me about this sparse PCA problem, and there are other problems where you essentially have two distributions where the conjecture is that it is hard to distinguish between these two, dis these two distributions. So in all these situations, as long as you can define some good meaning of simple Bayesian constraints, you can get an operator in some automatic way. And you hope that this operator will work to prove lower bounds for these problems too. So one thing that we have been able to do is we can recover the Grigoriev 3xor lower bound, if you know what that is in this really automatic fashion. Basically, if you, if you correctly set up the two distributions for uh, the 3xor CSP, then and you apply this procedure that we wrote, then you get the Grigoriev pseudo distribution automatically, so which is very nice. So one thing you can hope to do is basically unify all SOS lower bounds, if, if I'm going to be bold, because I've been bold very many times in this talk anyway. You can hope to prove new lower bounds for planted problems, like you can try to prove lower bounds of sparsest vector, uh, planted sparsest vector. Um, and if you are very, very bold, then you can attempt to pull lower bounds for small cell expansion or 2 to q norm. Of course, there we don't have any idea of uh, what the two distributions should be even. So uh, when you say you unify all the source lower bounds, you can get it for the degree for uh, sparse PCA? No, 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 no. I'm, uh, these are my goals. Sorry, they should have been open questions. Oh, yeah, yeah, it sounds like, yeah. Sorry. Sounds, yeah. yeah, that would be a great conclusion slide if I could prove everything. <laughs> Oh, for, for CSPs, yeah, no, no, what I we can show is that we can recover the operator. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, so I, 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 the hope is that you could also pull lower bounds for some harder problems where we have little idea about what hard instances look like. The other is a really, really uh, preachy version of uh, conclusion, which is that. Um, and it's, it's very, very, it's, it's much less concrete than what I said before. It is that this, this is Bayesian view of SOS, which is behind all of this, the religion uh, that we sort of developed here. And um, hopefully, well, it, it, it is possible that in somehow you can use these Bayesian constraints to actually derive conclusions for proving upper bounds uh, for interesting problems. Of course, I have no idea how to do this either, but uh, I hope that somebody does it. Okay, so. Uh, Thank you for listening. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for letting me go over time by like 15 minutes. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot.